AA I've Always Wanted To competition finalist, Patrick Reedy. Robert McGann, the industrialist, lay on his deathbed. His son Gerald sat on an armchair beside him. It distressed the 20-year-old young man to watch his father shift and turn in pain. He rose and he went to the bedroom window and viewed the magnificent grounds outside. A large lawn edged with an array of summer shrubs and flowers was drenched in the August sunlight. A little gate at the end of the lawn gave access to a winding pathway that led to a private beach. Everything about the place spoke of opulence. He turned to his father and he spoke gently. Tis cruel hard to see you suffer so much, Dad. Will I give you some more of the painkiller the doctor prescribed? No, my boy, he replied. Tis not the bodily pain. That disturbs me. More? No. It's the anguish and the guilt inside my head. Jerry looked shocked. Dad, you have no cause for anguish or guilt. You are a good man. You've had the priest to visit, and he gave you absolution. What is it that bothers you so much? Lots, my son, he whispered hoarsely. No doubt you've heard all about 1913 and the lockout. I was part of all that on the employer's side. You were just three at the time. We resisted the workers, especially in regard to those who don't tools in sympathy. It never dawned on us to show sympathy to the workers' families, the poor of Dublin, the appalling houses, the hungry. Stop, Dad. You're only upsetting yourself, Gerald, almost yelled. That was 21 years ago. Much has changed since then, the 1916 rising, the Great War. It was said at the time that the trade union leaders were obdurate, uncom uncompromising, and had much to answer as well. Not really, my boy. They had more care for the needy and the homeless than we, than we the employers, had. <laughs> Their convictions cost them so much deprivation, a lot more than all stance cost us. I had a change of heart when driving to and from my factory. I witnessed the havoc, the awful turmoil, the fallen buildings, and the dead. Yet, I didn't dare go against the big boys. God forgive me. At this, his father struggled to sit up, and his son hastened to his aid. Easy, Dad, he urged. Gerald, my boy, I want you to do something for me. On the top shelf of the wardrobe, you will find a box. Fetch it for me, please. Puzzled. Gerald did as he was bidden, and sure enough, found a slender box and handed it to his father, who was doing his best to stem a hacking cough. Can you guess what's inside, he asked. A watch, perhaps, Gerald said. The sick man shook his head as he opened the box to reveal a key, a large brass key, its sheen catching the rays of the dying sun. He looked at Gerald as he lifted the key from its place, Son, on the day of the lockout, as the workers approached, I instructed both my manager and my chief clerk to go and turn this key in the large gates of the factory. To my amazement, they both refused, and in great anger, I went myself. I slammed those gates in the faces of the workers and turned that accursed key. Gerald tried to instruct his father but he raised his hand to stay him. There's more, he said. One of those workers was Larry Osborne. At weekends, he was our gardener here, the one who first shaped the wonderful grounds of this mansion. He needed the additional earnings to educate and care for his wife and three daughters. <coughs> the sick man paused with tears in his eyes and with a huge burst of sadness proclaimed, I also sacked him. I locked him out of our home. Your mother and then the sister beseeched me to relent, but I stood my ground. God, that man had to struggle for years afterwards. These actions are at the root of my case, son. 
and I feel a woeful of remorse. Try your best not to die. Do you know an awful image? Do you know an awful image that troubles me right now, his father continued. I picture a time when these pains and sufferings of tuberculosis defeat me, and I go before my maker. He will hold this key in his hand, and I will be horrified to see him close the gates of heaven against me. Dad, you mustn't torture yourself like this. You have taught me that God is not like that. He is merciful. He is forgiving. You just need to forgive yourself. Please, Dad, for all our sakes, do that. We want you to enjoy peace at the last. <coughs> Son, you know full well that I have much time left. When you help, inherit my great wealth, I beg you to use it well and with generosity. Far, far better than I have done. But right now, take this key and walk to the edge of the sea, and with all your strength, cast it as far out <coughs> into the deep as possible. Maybe then, not even God will find it. At this, he laid back exhausted. As Gerald took the key, the atmosphere in the room seemed to change, and there was an air of peace. It was as if the passing of the key had somehow lifted his dying father's cares. As the he evening hid its light behind the waves, Gerald drew the curtains. Glancing at his father in the bed, he sadly realized that his light, too, had gone out. He gently closed the old man's eyes and kissed him on the brow. Then, holding the brass key in his hand, tears dimming his vision, he made his way towards the winding path that lay down to the sea. I also sacked him. I locked him out of our home. Your mother and elder sister beseeched me to relent, but I stood my ground. God, that man had to struggle for years afterwards. These actions are at the root of my guilt, son, and I feel a woeful remorse. Try your best not to die. Do you know an awful image? Do you know an awful image that troubles me right now, his father continued. I picture a time when these pains and sufferings of tuberculosis defeat me, and I go before my maker. He will hold this key in his hand, and I will be horrified to see him close the gates of heaven against me. Dad, you mustn't torture yourself like this. You have taught me that God is not like that. He is merciful. He is forgiving. You just need to forgive yourself. Please, Dad, for all our sakes, do that. We want you to enjoy peace at the last. <coughs> Son, you know full well that I have much time left. When you inherit my great wealth, I beg you to use it well and with generosity. Far, far better than I have done. But right now, take this key and walk to the edge of the sea, and with all your strength, cast it as far out <coughs> into the deep as possible. Maybe then, not even God will find it. At this, he laid back exhausted. As Gerald took the key, the atmosphere in the room seemed to change, and there was an air of peace. It was as if the passing of the key had somehow lifted his dying father's cares. As the he evening hid its light behind the waves, Gerald drew the curtains. Glancing at his father in the bed, he sadly realized that his light, too, had gone out. He gently closed the old man's eyes and kissed him on the brow. Then, holding the brass key in his hand, tears dimming his vision, he made his way towards the winding path that lay down to the sea. <laughs> Yeah.
now I have finally been accommodated by the Automobile Association and indeed by the management of the Abbey Theatre to stand on that stage and it has been a wonderful experience and I feel very fulfilled and a lifelong, it will be a highlight in my life now and I'm so happy.